And now it's time for Omniversica, the greatest show on the internet, with your hosts, Dan Schneider and Art Durkey. Welcome to Omniversica, the best internet radio show in the world. Uh, <laughs> this is Arthur Durkey and Dan Schneider um, and Dave Wesley bringing you a live interview from France with expatriate American poet James Emmanuel and his translator Jean Migren. And uh, we're going to also be playing some recordings of James reading his poetry. And we also have a recording of James reading some wonderful jazz poetry with saxophonist uh, Noel Howard. And that will be interspersed throughout the program. Meantime, uh, say hi, Dan. Uh, hi. Uh, <laughs> Uh, thanks, Art. Uh, for this second show, this is going to be the first interview. If anyone has listened to the online uh, presentation of our first show, Art and I basically told what the show is going to be about. And this is the first interview that we're going to be do doing with uh, assorted artists, uh, writers, uh, people of interest for various uh, mm -hmm. groups. Anyway, uh, James Emanuel is a poet that uh, I first uh, came across about four or five years ago. I stumbled upon a book of his collected poems in a half-price bookstore here uh, in Minnesota. And it was only like uh, $5, four ninety-five marked down from a $30 price. And uh, I'm one of those people that when you go troving through the bookstores, you know, if I see two or three good poems in 100 pages or so, I usually buy the book if it's reasonably mm -hmm. priced. Absolutely. So, so anyway, I, I found James's book, uh, read it, and then a couple of years ago, uh, when I first started my website, Cosmoetica.com, I wrote an essay uh, on uh, James's uh, neglect because, uh, interestingly enough, before I had done uh, my essay on James, uh, there was virtually nothing on James Emanuel on the internet and I think it's a classic uh, case you know of sort of maybe the Emily Dickinson syndrome where mm -hmm. someone in their lifetime does not uh, get any kind of recognition but uh, hopefully uh, uh, this is We'll uh, hopefully correct that situation now. And in fact, in fact, uh, uh, Jean Magren, uh, James's tr translator, had told me that, uh, well, maybe it wasn't Jean, but uh, there is a, a Russian fellow who now has started a, a James fan site as well. So anyway, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, James Emmanuel and uh, Jean Magren. And also a little bit later, we'll probably have a few minutes to speak with uh, Simone Godelieve, uh, a woman who's uh, doing a documentary for James. So James, do you want to say hello? Hello, hello. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> that was my voice in three registers. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard. <laughs> well, James, uh, I guess the, the most obvious thing that, uh, you know, I would want to talk about since you are living in France, um, uh, you know, you're not well known here in the States, and yet, uh, I mean, that's not a, a typical thing. I've, I've tended to find that uh, quality artists in, in any field tend to not get recognized in uh, in in. Uh, in their fields uh, until either very late when they've passed their prime or or sometimes until they're dead do you have any theories uh, i know that uh, we've had some correspondence but do you have any like overriding theories as to why uh, you've uh, gotten some critical neglect or, or publishing neglect in your lifetime at least in the states well i suppose that it's partly due to the fact that i left the united states some some people in the land of the free in the home of, have this idea that you love it or leave it. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, especially in the case of African-American poets, whose critics tend to be more intense in a certain way than other critics, uh, fail to pay enough attention <clears throat> to their brother poets, if I can use that term, mm -hmm. who leave the scene. They don't really care why you left the scene. They think, if they're thinking as uh, black people did in the 1960s, mm -hmm. that you should stay at home and serve your own community. I myself graduated from a high school which the graduating class had a motto, as all classes did, and this motto was made for our, not for ourselves, but for the world, mm -hmm. and I believed that. And so when I left the United States, I thought I was simply extending my 
personal self into wider realms. But I think critics in the United States as of this day do not think that way. So my departure from the United States, I believe, is the basic reason for my not getting any real attention there. Now that was in the late 70s or early 80s that you moved to France? Was well, in 1984, I came to France in a certain way. That is, I had uh, finished my academic career. What's the word for it? I was uh, retired. From I was retired. From teaching? Now, when I first yeah. came to France, that was in 1968, I came because I was invited to be the Fulbright professor at the University of Grenoble. Yeah. And when you're invited, you don't say no. <laughs> so I first came in 1968, and I came again 1972, and then definitively, as some people like to say, I came in 1984, and I've been here ever since. Mm -hmm. Now, you were born in 1921. When did you first start, get into poetry? Would it have been during the war years of the 40s? Oh, I wrote some poetry when I was a child. But, I mean, did you act that, I mean, when did you... Get, when did you have, like, your first uh, published poem? Was it in published the mid... published poem would have been in 1948. So that was just a... So uh, about that time, just looking at the chronology of uh, American poetry, especially considering black or African-American writers, the biggest names at that time would have been uh, a Langston Hughes and going b before that, a County Cullen. And, uh, uh, and that was about a year before uh, the first uh, major recognition. I think Wendelin Brooks won her Pulitzer Prize in 49. Mm -hmm. What was 50? Um, so how did now in that 30 or so years before you moved to France, did you see any movement in uh, the academic or in the publishing world regarding uh, black writers? What, was it a, a positive movement or was it almost sort of like uh, a parallel movement? Uh, 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 you know what I'm saying? Uh, you mean uh, literary movement parallel to what kind of movement? Well, in, in that in that black, there were a lot of black publishers and black presses that spouted up. Mm -hmm. uh, was w do you think that was a good thing, or or was it you know should should there have been you know more of a cohesion of uh, with within the mainstream of American? Because I mean, I know for example, I've always found it frustrating when I talk with Jess, you know, how women w writers are always compared to women writers, black writers are always compared to other black writers, uh, you know, whereas, you know, someone, if I wanted to compare, you know, some of your poetry to, say, a Robinson Jeffers or whatnot, that's not the first thing that any, you know, uh, critic ever brings up. You know, they'll, they won't compare you, you know, a sonnet you wrote to a Keats, they'll compare it naturally to, to maybe a County Cullen or another black writer. And yeah. Yeah, this is <clears throat> this is a critical narrow-mindedness, which is parallel to to racism. Okay. Actually, actually, there was <clears throat> little mainstream attention. Excuse me, I have a kind of a cold now, but you can hear me. I hope. Mm -hmm. Yes. There was little mainstream attention to even the best black poets. Mm -hmm. We had uh, in. About 1940, a major anthology called Negro Caravan. Mm -hmm. After that anthology was published, there was almost nothing that mainstream American publishers published, almost nothing, until my book that came out with my co-editor, uh, Theodore Gross, in 1968. Dark Symphony, Negro Literature in America. There was almost nothing. Was The Negro Caravan, was that Dudley Randall's book? No, no. Uh, the Negro Caravan was by Sterling Brown. Oh, okay. And, and, uh, Who was himself Arthur was a very Davis good poet, uh, Sterling Brown. This was a great, this was a great anthology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But after that, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing for almost 30 years. And I do believe that my book, Dark Symphony, broke, broke that, uh, long period of neglect mm -hmm. and in that long period of neglect there was no critical discussion among among uh, what you might call i don't even like you use the word quite critics there was no discussion mm -hmm. of black poets black poets didn't exist you see yeah and when they did exist in a literary sense starting in the mid 1960s then there was a uh, a publisher's rush to make money out of black anthologies, and there was 
there were quite a few anthologies that came out after mine and Ted Gross's. Right. Well, I guess another uh, another thing that uh, I uh, you know you're talking about the uh, black anthologies. One of the things that I found interesting, and uh, when I think in my mind of black American poets that that are the better ones, it seems the poets, and in fact this could be for any poets, that transcend whatever state they're from, whatever background, whatever philosophical stance they're coming from that that move beyond to sort of what i would call a cosmic view are those that succeed the best you know in my essay that you know that you first uh, had come upon you know i i did a couple of uh, had you know uh, analyzed a couple of your poems that you know you couldn't even tell that it, it was a black person that had written the poems and i, I remember, know yeah. and this this is true of uh, some of the best of gwendolyn brooks's poems That's robert right. hayden another uh, very neglected mm-hmm. writer um right. and i'm i'm wondering uh that you know, there was the famous schism between County Cullen and Langston Hughes back in the you know in the day when uh, uh, Cullen was almost as big a name as Hughes. Whether uh, a, a a black poet should be considered a poet who happened to be black, which was Cullen's view, and the more sort of insistence of a Langston Hughes that a black poet had to be a black poet first. Do you is that argument relevant to you? And if so, what uh, side would you? Choose. The argument means personally almost nothing to me. I think it's a part of the the regretful uh, narrow mindedness mm-hmm. of people who put race above every other thing. In my opinion, a poet writes what he wants to write and what he can write according to his experience. What critics think of it should mean nothing to the poet outside their judgment of the quality of his poem. Uh, In black literature, there has been a a, a chasm of ignorance in the critical uh, profession. Mm -hmm. They they don't seem to be able to consider a black poet as a poet. Now, this may not be true of all critics, but this is an endemic weakness in American criticism to consider a black person first as black, and then to superimpose upon that what other uh, personal standards of excellence they may have. But they haven't grown up, and I use the word uh, specifically, Mm -hmm. they haven't grown up enough to understand that a black poet is a poet. This simple thing Mm -hmm. most of them cannot understand yet. But, you know, we could could talk for an hour about that and Mm -hmm. yet... (laughs) No farther than we are right now. <laughs> and following up on that, James, you spoke earlier about the kind of regrettable intensity that a lot of the the criticism that of of black poets has. Um, I'm I'm hearing what what I'm imagining is is that one of the reasons that you're neglected um, in poetry criticism in the U.S. is very much what you're talking about. This this whole attitude. I think maybe by white critics and black critics that you have to see the black person before the poet rather than the poet before the black person. Um, does that tie back into that whole whole problem of, of, of being known or being discovered? And I wondered, you know, if that's also maybe why some people are discounting Cullen, even though he's a great poet, um, in favor of Hughes all the time these days. Well, I don't know really why they would favor Cullen... <clears throat> Over Hughes, I don't know. It depends upon the the standards and the basic critical stance of the critic concerned. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hughes and Cullen have different excellences. Mm-hmm. It's hard to beat yeah. Cullen as a sonneteer, mm-hmm. and it's hard to beat Hughes as a poet who combines basic poetic excellence with an unbreakable affection Mm -hmm. for his race Mm -hmm. and a lifelong dedication to his purpose of revealing black uh, experience in America. This was his, this was Hughes's, as he told to me personally, Mm -hmm. this was Hughes's specific goal to illuminate the experience of black people in the United States. That's what he wanted to do. This was not Cullen's purpose. Mm-hmm. You see, Cullen wanted to be a poet. Right. 
Sure. Now, I don't see any difference between being a poet and being a black person or being a black poet. I don't see any difference at all mm -hmm. because I use those words very carefully. Poet. A poet is a certain kind of person mm -hmm. and a certain kind of writer. His race has almost nothing to do with it. His race only is the seed bed out of which his beginning poetry evolved. It's nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. Well, let, 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 let's end this uh, first segment uh, with uh, these two uh, questions. Um, number one, uh, and you can think about it while I uh, ask part two, um, wh who would you consider the, the top critics uh, in America or worldwide regarding poetry in general and or African-American poetry? And my second follow-up to that would be, you know, uh, there is a sort of tokenism. And let's face it, Langston Hughes was sort of the, the golden boy who was chosen to be the representative African-American poet of the 20th century to the neglect of a Paul Lawrence Dunbar, a Margaret Walker, uh, a Cullen, yourself, a Brooks, and, you know, even a Sterling Brown and some other big names. Um, how much do you think that sort of, you know, well, we have to have one uh, at the exclusion of all others, has contributed to the state of yours and some other, uh, you know, more neglected African American writers' uh, stature. Well, when you say that might, some critics might say we have to have one, now of course you're referring to black black poets. This this criterion mm -hmm. has nothing to do with excellence. It's what I might loosely call a political consideration. We have to have one black poet, meaning we don't care. We don't care how good he is. Mm -hmm. He just has to be out there to indicate our, our honest intention. He could be a mediocre poet, but he's black. Uh, I, I despise this kind of judgment because it isn't judgment at all, at all. And it is a pure mockery of literature in general and human nature in general to to express this idea, even if you have it, you should shut your mouth and say nothing about it if that's the way you feel. So, to me, a good black critic, I mean, I said critic, but I was thinking poet, a good black poet is a good poet, period. Mm -hmm. A good Indian poet, a good uh, es Eskimo poet Gay is poet. a good poet, period. Mm -hmm. But... But what I'm saying is a, a platform or a, a level of appreciation that many people strangely cannot manage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they and, simply cannot manage it. And if, if you were to choose, you know, one or two critics that uh, come to your mind as people who have uh, really enlightened or, or presented uh, good poetry in general to the public, who would you name? Yeah, or, or who even get it really, in some ways. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't name anybody because I don't, I don't know. I haven't ever judged the critical establishment in that way. Okay. I just remember I have a letter from Mark Van Doren. Mm -hmm. Mark Van Doren, who evidently was able to judge clearly, but I don't know whether Mark Van Doren ever wrote a book of criticism. Uh, I think he did. In fact, he, he's not a bad technical poet. He's sort of like, you know... Uh, he he's one someone who I think is is kind of neglected too, and I think a lot of that has to do from the quiz show scandals of his son. Oh yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, uh, right, well, yeah. anyway, uh, let's end this first segment, and we're gonna uh, then uh, listen to a poem or two of James right now, and then we're gonna come back with some more questions for James uh, and John McGren, his translator. So here's some poems by James Emanuel. For a farmer. Something slow moves through him, watched by hills. Something low within each rock receives his noonday wish, then crumbles rich. So fills each furrow that the prairie year upheaves. His arm has lain with boulders. His copper hand has mused on roots, uncaring of barbed wire. His fist has closed on thistle and dug the land for corn October snows have whelmed entire. 
something flows with him in stubborn streams and in the parted foliage something lives in upright green stirred by the rhythmic gleams of his hoe and spade from worn out arms he gives the earth receives turns all his pain to soil where he believes and testifies through toil. For the fourth grade prospect school, how I became a poet. My kite broke loose, took all my string and backed into the sun. I followed far as I could go and high as I could run. My special top went spinning down the gutter, down the drain. I heard it gurgling sideways, saw it grinning in the rain. My string wrapped around it while I reached for it in vain. My dog got thin and went away. He took his leash, the wrapping string that we pretended was a rope went as far as he could hope to find the sick bed where I lay. And now, when I remember strings and how they bind together things and how they stretch like reach and run and hold like hope and give like sun, I tie together things I know and wind up with a poem to show. Okay, we're back here uh, uh, on Omniversica talking with James Emmanuel and his French translator, Jean Magren. Now, uh, other than uh, reading James's collected poems and having several of his books, uh, there's James's biography called <laughs> the Force and the Reckoning, uh, a biography, uh, or actually an autobiography written by James. Uh, now, James, you were born in 1921, and I guess, you know, you, you reached manhood during the Great Depression. Um, I know uh, about a year or so ago, I read a, a really great book uh, by a, a poet and scientist named Lauren Isley, who described uh, hitching the rails during the Great Depression. Uh, does does that any of that ring a bell with you, or were you more sedentary in, in mid-America, Nebraska? No, uh Riding the rails means something to me. I, I've, I've uh, hopped a train or two, but I didn't go far. No. My brother did that a little. <clears throat> he had to do that a little more than I did. But there are many black young men and black men who did. <clears throat> excuse me, ride the rails. But the the depression, I knew. I knew that through <clears throat> cold and damp. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> excuse me. Excuse me. And uh, and poverty. I knew the Depression very, very well. Did uh, the Dust Bowl ever touch as far north as Nebraska? It must have, because I've seen dust storms in yeah. which entire huge cardboard boxes were hurled high into the air. I've seen this personally. Uh, dust Bowl in terms of, uh, what's the name of this movie with Henry Fonda was in it? Oh, uh, the Grapes of Wrath. Grapes of Wrath. Grapes yes. of Wrath. That that kind of of dirt poverty I didn't see, mm-hmm. but the but the essence I knew what it was to be alive in the Great Depression and to feel what people feel who are desperately poor. I know what that means. Yeah, I know. My dad uh, was my dad, who uh, died in 1983, was born in 1916, and he he uh, went uh, in the Great Depression. He served out in Idaho in the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, uh, I, I served in the same corps. Oh, you did in what state? In Kansas. And what were you like building roads or what? What? Well, they they we 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 built uh, we planted trees, built a, did a little road work. Everything was segregated there, you know. It was an all black. Even camp. The, even the, even the CCCs were segregated. Yeah, absolutely. Only a few of the officers were white. Everybody else was black. Mm-hmm. America then was simply a segregated society. That's all there is to it. Uh-huh. But I knew the CC camps very mm-hmm. well. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
And did you serve in the Second World War? Yes, I did. I was an infantry sergeant in the Second World War. Now, after the war, um, I don't know, I know in reading your bio, uh, it's been about a year or so since I read it, maybe not quite, but uh, you also spent time in Washington, D.C. Were you there as a diplomat or uh, a, a typical bureaucrat, or what was uh, what was uh, your purpose in uh, the Capitol? Well, when I was working in a junkyard in Rock Island, Illinois, I took several civil service exams. I always got grades up in the 90s, sometimes 96, 97, hmm. but they never called me for work. But once they did call me to come to Washington, that was in 1942, and I came there and they picked me as being the confidential secretary to General Benjamin o. B. O. Davis, who was the first black general in the American Army. I was his personal secretary. Okay. I think they picked me not only because I had an excellent record, but because I came from the Wild West. And therefore, <laughs> in, their, in their mind, and they were quite correct, I was an old uh, geronimo up, if I could use that term, <laughs> about, about civil rights. So I was a country boy, but I was an excellent secretary, and they figured they wouldn't have any trouble with me, you see? Mm -hmm. And so I became the... I became the confidential secretary of the first black general in the United States, hmm. who, who uh, was an excellent, excellent man and the first real gentleman that I ever knew. Hmm. I learned a lot working with him. Yeah, Benjamin O. Davis is is a figure that uh, you know sort of overlooked in uh, in. Uh, military history i know yes, uh, he was sort true. of the colin powell of his day in in, in that sense in terms yes. of he was uh, a member of roosevelt's black cabinet mm -hmm. okay when uh, now uh, after how long did you work in dc and did you then uh, did you simply grow out of the civil service or decide to go back uh, to get a degree and how did you get into academia to become a professor or a teacher well first let me see how i left davis uh, while working for, for General Davis, I knew all, I knew everything because I, I read all of the Army regulations, or most of them. And I knew about malingering, you know, pretending that something was wrong with you so you wouldn't have to go into the Army. I knew all about that. And so, <laughs> when they first called me to go into the Army, I used my knowledge to stay out of the army. <laughs> now, afterwards, I realized that if I ever was going to make anything of myself, I had to go to college. I knew that I, uh, the way things were going, I would never have money enough to go to college. But then I learned about the GI Bill of Rights that was being formed, mm -hmm. and that if I had go into the army, I would be able to get a college education. And so I. I asked the draft board to call me in again for an examination, and of course I passed, and I went into the Army. And while I was in the Army, General Davis, I don't know, I think uh, where it was, but he asked me if I wanted to be his, his, his personal secretary as a soldier. I knew then I, that I would have an easy time, but by then I had become what you call... <laughs> A, a real soldier. I guess I knew the jungle, and I had uh, I could take care of myself. So I told him no thanks, that I would keep on being a, what I was, a sergeant. And but then, as a result of this military experience, which I deliberately did, in order to get a chance to go to college, then I then I went to college. And you know, once I start something, I want to be good at it. So once I began to have a college education. I wanted to go to the top, which meant that I wanted to get, I wanted to go as high as you can go in education. I wanted to get a PhD. Mm -hmm. So I didn't stop until I achieved that goal. And was your major then on uh, English or literature or did that? It was that an English literature, because at the Howard University, the chairman of the department urged us who were uh, English majors to, because we were black, he said, you know, blackness conditions so many things in the United States. Yeah. He said, choose a field that everybody doesn't choose so that you will be needed when you apply for a job as a college teacher. 
And so I chose the 17th century in English literature because not many people did that. Mm -hmm. Later on, before getting my PhD, I switched to black, black literature because I thought I should know something about the literature of, in quotes, my own people, in quotes. This cost me an additional two years of study, but I, I switched and did that. Mm -hmm. Now, did, uh, did your academic career, did that lead into uh, publication, or was this a separate pursuit outside of it? And was there a sort of, uh, at your university, or it, over the course of your career, you know, I, I know that you've written books about other black writers and, and whatnot. Was there a sort of collegial atmosphere, or was there a lot of competition between uh, assorted uh, peers, you know, in, in, in your particular group, uh, you know, black writers attempting mm -hmm. to get published in the 50s or 60s? Well, the university that I went to was one of the most competitive in the United States. So in order to be promoted there, you had to publish, even the, you know, the old phrase, publish or perish, mm -hmm. apply. Mm -hmm. And so, not only did I, did I want to be a writer, I had to be a writer in an academic way in order to be, in order to get promoted. And so, I chose to write about uh, black American writers after my first essays were, my first published work was not about black people at all. Mm -hmm. about Ralph Waldo Emerson and other things. And but what year was that? What year? Yeah. 1961. Okay. okay. It was called Emersonian Virtue, a definition. I read through many, many works of em Emerson to find out what virtue meant to him. Uh -huh. But I switched, to, I switched to black literature because I knew that within a few years it would be important and that if you knew about it, you would have a chance you would have a chance to publish and to rise. But when I, when I was writing essays on black literature, there were no pathways to follow. There were no guidebooks. You had to get it all. You had to learn it yourself. You had to dig it up. You had to dig it up yourself. Mm -hmm. And of course, after several years after I began, after my Dark Symphony, you could go to uh, college and you could major in black literature. See, when I was in college, I couldn't learn anything about black literature. I had to do all of it outside my regular duties, because there were no courses. There weren't any. I've met people, I've met people, teachers who told me that my book was their, was their Bible when they were university teachers, which was, of course, pleasant for me to hear. Well, let me just ask you, um would you would you uh, uh, have preferred to have been an outsider, uh, not in, in academia, and sort of if you could have you know sustained yourself financially, you know, not be attached to it and, and just do what you do, or do you think you benefited by being in academia? I benefited, of course. I benefited because I wound up in a highly competitive university that many un teachers, you know, were trying to get into, and I benefited by. Printing, printing material that was extremely useful mm -hmm. to the scholars who followed me. James, um, at some of the same time that um, African American poetry was coming to the forefront, there was the, also the movement from the West Indies and from West Africa called Negritude by Leopold Senghor and Amy Cesare, some of those poets. Did you ever feel a connection to or, or have knowledge of or, or teach any of those poets or um, feel that they related in some oh, way? Yes, yes to, even the word Negritude. <laughs> right. Okay. Immediately, of course, I wrote a poem entitled Negritude. Right. It was one of the first poems in the United States which, which used the word black as often as I used it in that poem, in a positive, positive way. I wrote the poem in about 1958, I guess. <coughs> so, negritude was important simply because of what the word meant. Mm -hmm. and what the word negritude is, let's say the life, the life of black people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And anybody who is black has to feel a connection with negritude. That's what the world that's the sticker, the etiquette, the sticker that the world slaps on them. Okay. So they had to know about it. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
Well, James, I think we're going to end this segment then uh, with listening to a few more of your poems. And when we come back, I think we'll change gears a little and uh, speak with uh, your French translator, Jean Magren, and also Simone Godelieb, uh your biographical documentarian, and ask a little bit. And we'll give you a chance to rest your voice for a little bit. So okay. let's listen to some poems by James Emmanuel. Sonnet for a Writer Far rather would I search my chaff for grain And cease at last with hunger in my soul And suck the polished wheat another brain Refurbished till it shone by art's control To stray across my own mind's half-hewn stone And chisel in the dark in hopes to cast a fragment of our common self, my own, excels the mimicry of sages past. Go forth, my soul, in painful, lonely flight, even if no higher than the earth-bound tree, and feel suffusion with more glorious light, nor envy eagles their proud brilliancy. Far better to create one living line than learn a hundred sunk in fame's recline. The Negro Never saw him, never can Hypothetical, haunting man Eyes a saucer, yes sir, bosser, dice a clicking, razor flicking. The ness froze him in a dance. A ness never had a chance. Okay, we're back, and in this segment of the show, uh, we're going to be talking with Jean Magren, uh, James Emmanuel's translator, and also. God leave Simone's. Yeah. Uh, okay, I got it. Uh, well, let's talk about translation just for a second, uh, leaving James behind just for a second. It's, it's a question that I've asked a number of translators over the years, um, uh, and I, I, I'm sure you're probably familiar with a translator named Stephen Mitchell, uh, who translated uh, Rainer Maria Rilke uh, here in America, or, 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 are, or are you? No, not right? at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. How about uh, A. Poulin, who translated uh, uh, some of Rilke's French poetry? No. Okay. Well, uh, well. generally, I've always wondered, uh, because I've always found that uh, translators generally have to be good, competent poets themselves. On the other hand, they don't, they, they really can't necessarily be uh, sort of visionary poets themselves. Otherwise, they impose too much of themselves into a translation. For example, there's an American poet here named Robert Bly, who you, you may have heard of, yeah. who uh, is, is well known, but he sort of, all of his translations are sort of Blythian. And I'm wondering, when you translate someone, whether it's James or any of the other poets you've translated, how, how uh, much do you pay attention to that slipping of your own persona into a poetry, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, you have a point here. Because I, if there is something that is signed Jean Migraine, and you can detect in what I write, it's not for me to say. It's for those who read me, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. will certainly find, yes, there certainly is a Migraine style, mm -hmm. one way or another, I'm not able to say what it is, because I don't practice it. Uh -huh. But I'm sure there is a migrant style. It's when you compare translations of one poem done by three or four different translators, and that's how, by the way, how I met James mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, then you can see that some this poet writes something, and this translator writes something that belongs to him, and that translator writes something that belongs to him, number two, and number three. Yes, that definitely is a style. Well, let's just expand, expound a little bit here. Uh, how did you meet James, uh, uh, if you would go into a little more detail? Uh, that was in uh, 1987. 
uh, two years before that, I was asked by a friend of mine who was a teacher of philosophy in my school and also a poet, a well-known French poet called Hugues Labrus. He, was, uh, he wanted to uh, publish an anthology of New York poets. And he'd asked people to uh, come with translations and nobody came up. And so he said, turned to me and said, could you do it? And I did the whole book. And then doing the book, I met or corresponded with a certain number of poets, particularly Marilyn Hacker. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I said that, well, this anthology, this selection is not balanced. Where are the Jews? Where are the blacks? Where are the this and where are the that? You know? Mm -hmm. And she suggested that I ask a certain number of people for other, for more poets. And that's why I got uh, one James A. Emanuel on my list. I went to Paris to uh, this Festival Franco-Anglais de Poésie, which had been uh, running for about four or five years, and where they have um, English-speaking poets and French-speaking poets, and sometimes they invite translators, and I was invited there, thanks to Marine Hacker again, and I did my job as um, translator and I audited a few translations, and uh, the final session, I was asked to read poems that had been selected the year before. And among the poems that were selected the year before, there, were, there was a couple by one James A. Emanuel. I'd never seen him before. And in front of me at the moment, there is a photo taken at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, where there are two, five, uh, seven people in the front row, to, I don't know, James A. Emanuel, Jean Migraine, Marine Hacker, the Tunisian poet Tar Bekri, and a Canadian-American George Ellen Bogan. And so we were there, and that's where I first saw the man, James A. Emanuel. But what I read was uh, his poetry, because the one who had translated him was not there. And I said, well, that's good poetry. Uh, may I translate your poetry? And blah, and blah. That was that. Was it, was it that you, you felt this guy really needs an audience? I mean, what was the motivation, or was it more out of a personal connection? Uh, personal, I didn't have time enough to know the man. Uh -huh. But the, poem, uh, the poems, I had about three or four poems in my hand. The poems I read were really potent, and I knew that there was something behind it. Mm -hmm. It was not uh, just doggerel and no trash. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I want to translate that. So the work itself brought you in, then? Pardon? The work itself brought you in, the poetry itself brought you yes, in. Yes. Okay. Um, to me, I never translated anything before, but I was a teacher of English, so translation was part of my job, but translating prose or anything. Mm -hmm. But translation has always been a vice, and as a matter of fact, going to that session in Paris was uh, sort of my coming out as a translator. Okay. Oh, so this began your whole career as a translator? Yes, then. indeed. Ah, okay. Um... What is James's reputation uh, in the continent? If, if is his are his books published in, or does he even have a, a singular book or a collected of poems published in France uh, or in any other countries across Europe? Uh, That's for him to answer. Oh, James, do you, do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, could you could you kind of break that down into well, a short well, question? Okay, yeah, basically, I mean, uh, how many books? Uh, are published of yours in Europe or in France, and uh, how how is the differing reception uh, of your work uh, in France compared to the States? Only a few, maybe two of my books, two of my 14 books of poetry came out in uh, France. Of course, uh, Jean is not showing me, uh, oh, it's not really a book, it's a magazine in which I'm the, the guest poet. I have many poems in it. Mm -hmm. The other is the L'Orage au Coeur, which was published here in Normandy in 1992, 1992. Now, as a result of the book in, well, let me put it this way. The book that I had published in France, the Mohaj au had an effect unlike anything that had followed the book of, my, of mine in the United States in the sense that a radio program on the uh, radio uh, France uh, Culture. There's a show on which the during which the participants discussed this book in some detail. 
This was, I think, in September, September 3rd, 1992. This never happened in the United States. Yeah. In the United States, I have reason to feel that no one in the United States has ever looked closely at my best poems, mm -hmm. even as of, maybe as of, of this day. No well-known critic knows or even has looked at mm -hmm. my representative poems. But this has happened in France. Well, let me ask you, um, I, I'm holding in my hand Whole Grain Collected Poems 1958 to 1989 by Lotus Press Incorporated, uh, mm -hmm. located in Detroit, Michigan, here in the U.S. Uh, is Jean or uh, anyone else working on translating the, your whole collected works or poems? Mm -hmm. I've never, I've never asked, okay. perhaps never will ask anyone to translate all, because that's about 345, at least 345 poems. Mm -hmm. I would be interested in getting my best poems translated, and Jean has already translated most of my best poems that I, that I wrote up to the point, up to the date of uh, Whole Grain, 1991. Well... But, uh Carry on, carry oh, on. Yeah. Uh, Jean, then, uh, are there any other translators in any other of the languages on the continent that uh, have expressed interest in translating Jean into German or Finnish or whatever? James, I, I never heard. You, you, might, you may have been translated into German, have you? Well, oh, I've had isolated poems translated into Russian, German, uh, Italian, Yugoslav, <laughs> Italian, yes, but not, not, a, not a whole group. A poem, other than what Jean did for the magazine Sud, and he can tell you about mm -hmm. that. But uh, the point is, uh, we started with Dollarage Walker in 1992. Uh, there is no market for translated poetry in France, except if you happen to uh, sleep with well-placed people uh, <laughs> in the big publishers' uh, offices or yeah. be bedrooms, you it's, know? It's the same here, I think, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, no, uh, in, in all... this friend of mine, Hugues Labrus, <laughs> uh, and t students of ours, who were uh, students in economics, we uh, founded a, pu uh, a firm. We were our own publishers, and I lost money uh, in the venture because I said that well if you last 10 years boys that will be fine they lasted 5 mm -hmm. so I had time to publish uh, an anthology of New York poets and number 2 was uh, James Emmanuel's De La Rage au Coeur it's a bilingual face to face book and I translated what James uh, submitted give and take a few that we discarded or that we reintroduced after that uh, but that was already an anthology uh, to date, 1992. And after that, what I translated uh, was published into odd uh, publications that nobody reads, you see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, but I'm... the point is that James is a very active reader, and he goes all over France, and uh, he also went uh, in Europe and Africa, sponsored by the U.S. Embassy, if I, if I was right for different reasons. I'm not going into this business again. But, um, so, this book helped in the French-speaking world. Mm -hmm. And I tried to renew the, exper the experiment with another black poet I'm not going to name. She uh, refused to follow suit, and we sold only 30 copies. Okay. Well, I was going to say, uh, when you mentioned before uh, about uh, needing to sleep with someone uh, to get something published in France, you, you know, I, I think you're still a ahead of us, because in America, it only takes a blowjob, so... I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, when I'm in sleep, I, I, you can take any position you like. <laughs> but, but anyway, let me, let me just ask, ask you another question. <laughs> John, let me just ask you another question, and then uh, if, if, if Godley uh, can come on and talk about James's documentary, a bit um, uh, in America this this sort of uh, idea and I don't know if it's true or if it's mythic since uh, I'm pretty much a city boy the only time I've ever been out of uh, the States was uh, a brief trip one day with my parents to New Brunswick uh, from crossing the border from Maine but uh, <laughs> I was just wondering um, Europe Europe seems to always be a ahead of America in 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 certain terms of uh, 
aesthetics in terms of appreciating things. I mean, you know, you have nude beaches, whereas here in America, you know, we'll shrink from that. And uh, there, there also seems to be an appreciation for a lot of under underappreciated artists from America. I think uh, uh, back in the 1900s, wasn't uh, Whistler, wasn't Whistler more appreciated in France than uh, uh, James McNeil Whistler more appreciated in I France? I think Whistler is, a, is very famous among French people. I mean, lots of people can quote his name, uh -huh. but they've never seen his pictures. But yeah. Whistler, yes, is someone I heard uh, years ago. I heard right. of years ago. And of course, there's the Jerry Lewis factor, who uh, you know, uh, the the fr it, it's it's sort of a, a common myth over here that Jerry Lewis's films, uh, you know, are widely praised in France, whereas you know they're sort of uh, late night uh, two two a.m. in the morning TV fare over here. And Woody, yeah, well, Woody uh, Allen yeah. too. But uh, <laughs> I, I may may I add something else? Yeah, sure. Uh, I spent my life teaching English mm -hmm. as a language and as literature. And I've always felt that American literature appealed to me far more than British literature. Hmm. I think the Brits write with their heads, and their heads are rather weak. <laughs> the, the, the Americans write with their guts. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, to me, mm -hmm. William Faulkner is the greatest period. Mm -hmm. And behind Faulkner, there's so many Americans, whether they spend their years in France or not, doesn't matter much. But American literature means something. I still read American literature. I don't really read English literature at all. I'm not talking of Irish mm -hmm. literature, which is something different, even bigger and greater than anything else. I've also translated um, Irish poets. I translated Stephen Spender. Uh -huh. oh, but okay. Sir, Sir Stephen Spanner was cool as a cucumber. <laughs> See, <laughs> whereas my American poets, I wrote to them, visited them in the States when they were in the States. They came to my place. I even had Mr. Saul Bellow, the Nobel laureate, in my bedroom where James is sleeping tonight. Uh -huh. And so American literature to me is live literature. Well, let me just ask before we uh, bring Simone on. Uh, I'm sorry, go to leave. Uh, uh, what other uh, people have you translated uh, uh, or uh, been associated with? I mean, you, you mentioned a few other poets that you've translated. Uh, if you could just enumerate a few of them. Translated and published at the same time as I began with this anthology of uh, New York poets is Henry Taylor, his uh, Flying Change Pulitzer winner. Mm -hmm. uh, I translated also uh, Richard Wilbur, which you don't like, but <laughs> that's the whole thing, which I could well, not publish. Well, this is, this is one of the things... This is one of the things I say, James. Is it's not about like I I, no, I have no, no, nothing no, no. good. I, the, I I always say art is about excellence or not, rather like or dislike. Yeah, I always try to make a distinction. But anyway, go <laughs> no, ahead. <laughs> I was just joking. Yeah, I know. No, I did I did a complete Richard Wilbur. Uh -huh. I have done a complete Dylan Thomas. Uh -huh. Okay. Because the translations that are on the market in France, to my mind, are no good or disasters. Uh -huh. But again, who was going to publish that? The mm -hmm. market is quoted. Uh, I published Stephen Spender and lots of uh, minor Marine Hacker. So I did a book, a whole book uh, of Marine Hackers, uh, but that was when my publishers went bankrupt. And so the book uh, never saw, uh, saw the light, yeah. but never saw the second day. So, the, is poetry, does it actually sell a little bit better in, in France uh, than you would think? Because, I mean, in, in America, if no. you sell 500 copies, it's, it's considered good. <laughs> 500 copies is a miracle. Yeah. But in America, you have your universities. Uh -huh. They want to have a list of authors. Yeah. In France, we don't have that. Okay. okay. Well, if we could turn then, uh, if Godleaf could uh, step up, she's uh, doing a documentary about James Emanuel uh, for his archives for uh, the Library of Congress here in the United States. Uh, Godleaf, are you there? Yes. Uh, well, first off, what is the name of the documentary, and how did you meet James, and uh, uh, what what tack did you take? Uh, is it more of a biographical piece or more of a day in the life, if you could just expound a bit? No, uh, we didn't choose a name yet because it's uh, not a professional uh, uh, movie. It's just an uh, amateur movie. But when I start this uh, video, uh, it's uh, like to, to have some uh, memory of uh, 
things uh, I, lay, I like with uh, James Emmanuel. But uh, after a certain time, I think that uh, I can use my video camera to make some documentary about him uh, because I have the opportunity to meet some of uh, his friends in the side of France. And all these people uh, are teachers at the university with uh, James Emmanuel. And uh, I see that maybe I can make something with uh, these people because they know very well James for a certain number of years. And I know some of his uh, w work also. Uh, I know him as a man, but also as a teacher. And I can see that uh, they will ap they appreciate very well James Emmanuel. And, and for this reason, I propose to James to start this uh, kind of uh, video. Uh -huh. And uh, so we meet uh, some of uh, his colleagues there, who accept to uh, first speak about uh, their uh, friendship with uh, James Emmanuel, but also about uh, what James Emmanuel um, uh, let them discover about African-American literature, about uh, his own work, because he makes in uh, Toulouse some uh, uh, readings about his poetry. And uh, so I propose them to make some interview, and it's uh, Marvin Holt, an old friend from James Emmanuel, who interviewed all these people. Then James proposed me to go to United States in New York and meet uh, some of uh, his colleagues at the University of the City College in uh, New York and some people from Columbia University. And so I go there and uh, they prepare this uh, video uh, interview in another way because I, I didn't have somebody who can interview them. So uh, each of them um, speak about uh, their own relationship with James Emmanuel as friend or as a colleague. And then all of them propose to analyze part of the work that they know about James Emmanuel. And, ha and oh, I'm sorry, go, go continue. Yes. Then we continue this interview with a big specialist of uh, African-American literature in Paris, Michel Faber, who accept to uh, be interviewed by uh, Marvin Old again. We continue this uh, documentary with uh, some people in uh, Caen, Jean Migraine. Nicole Lamotte will illustrate some uh, works from uh, James Emmanuel. And uh, Michel uh, Migraine, uh, Jean, uh, Jean uh, uh, wife. Wife and a uh, wonderful cook. <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen. <laughs> Well, God, well, Godly, um, let me just ask you, how did you meet James? Were you a former student of his? Or? Oh, yeah, I met James in uh, 1990 okay. at a Biennale in Liège. It's a city in Belgium who makes a Biennale about poetry every two years. Uh -huh. And uh, it's uh, the organizer who asked me to go there uh, because uh, I make a book, I uh, illustrate a book of him. And he insists this uh, year to uh, propose me to go there. At the beginning, I say yes, but I am not very really convinced. And at the end, because I need a little bit uh, uh, recovering from a little depressed after I, I write the book with uh, Arturo about the, the concentration camp, I go there. And uh, the last day, I go to a reading of uh, a text from James Emmanuel and find this text so beautiful that I try to meet him after the reading. And I asked him if he can send me a copy of the, the text. And uh, our relationship began like that. I proposed yeah. to illustrate uh, uh, some of his poem. And uh, now uh, we are close friends for more than uh, 10 years. Well, uh, so this is more than a, a personal labor of love to, to get information uh, down about James uh, rather than, uh, you know, for theatrical distribution or anything, correct? No, uh, not really commercial. What I want is uh, to uh, give a complimentary to all the stuff uh, James put at the um, um, Library of Congress and uh, maybe to try to help people who want to write a biography about James or uh, uh, oh, a work, yeah, a research about James Emmanuel. That's the, the, the goal of my yeah. And my you, you had mentioned you uh, uh, 
uh, I think something about a book. Are you a writer by profession or, or what? No, 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 no. I am an engraver and a physical education teacher. Oh, okay. <laughs> but well, passionate by uh, literature and uh, things like that. Okay, well, I think we're going to end this segment here, and uh, we'll uh, uh, listen to a few more poems by uh, James Emanuel, and then when we come back, we'll have James uh, speak some more. Thank you. To kill a morning spider Like a thick black pencil mark Whipped suddenly across the pine wood floor His blot at the bed corner Leaped to my tightening shoe swelled into an ape-legged coil, oozing fur, it seemed, angering to be recognized as spider. He quivered once. In a paroxysm seized his stomach, gripped something there. A tiny thing hopped from him, whirling, just as my foot clutching at itself, smashed his eight legs. The wheeling little thing, in pausing, killed itself. My shoe, an engine on its own, crushed what was there. Such is surprise, his destiny. A spider in disguise, an insect, fleeing, and we watchers from our sleep awaking to close their being. Okay, we're back uh, on Omniverska talking to James Emmanuel from France, uh, his translator, Jean Magren. Uh, James, uh, you had some points that you wanted to make uh, off air what you were talking. I'm sorry, uh, if you want to continue. Oh, the point I wanted to make was this, that I think African-American literary critics should consider that they have the absolute duty to keep track of what African-American writers all over the world are doing. They should not, they should not demand that African-American writers stay at home in the United States and spend the rest of their lives there. These critics should follow them wherever they go, especially if they are continuously writing and producing and publishing, as I am. Mm -hmm. This, I wish, I wish that they could be made to understand that it is their duty to do this, to discover what writers, African-American writers abroad are doing, to read what these writers are writing, and to comment on it if they think it is worthy of commentary. Mm -hmm. it's, that's important, I think. Okay. Now, James, let's, uh, let, let me just change gears a little bit. Um, since uh, we're talking to you, and I'm talking to you because I think you're a great poet, not a black poet, let's talk about the actual craft of poetry in this segment a little bit. Um, and uh, I think it's something that whenever I've heard interviews of uh, artists or writers, they rarely talk about. Usually they talk about their politics or, you know, their, their biographical uh, information or whatnot. But let's talk about it. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've found interesting uh, in your work is that you're one of the few published poets that I can say uh, seems equally adept in free verse as in formal verse. And I know there are a couple of sonnets that I had written an essay about uh, uh appraising a, a sonnet for a farmer and uh, no, a sonnet for a writer and for a farmer and uh, do you do you uh, have any particular affection for either free verse or for formal uh, do you think you're better in one or the other uh, in the beginning I used I think I used formal formal uh, patterns because that's what I knew mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what I studied and that's what I taught but I could say that when my life changed, when I had so much trouble, <laughs> so much trouble in my life, the trouble seemed my whole environment, I simply, I didn't have the patience or the feeling for formal verse anymore. Mm -hmm. I wanted an absolutely free reign in saying whatever I had to say mm -hmm. or expressing whatever I had to feel. I didn't want any constraints whatsoever. 
And that's what I followed for years. It's only in, say, 1992 when I created uh, Jazz and Blues and Gospel Haiku that I uh, chained myself down to the formalities of the 17th syllable, formerly Japanese haiku. But I, won't, I, I prefer free voice because it's free. You might say I like the word free. <laughs> I'd, I'd like you to, to talk a little bit more about those jazz haiku. We have, a, we have your recording, and we'll play a little bit um, later on in the show for, for the listeners to hear a couple pieces, but um, you, you call it at one point a breakaway haiku, and it's almost like you've taken the haiku basic concept and structure, but then you've exploded it and moved it in jazz directions. Um, could you talk about what led you there, or, 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 uh, or was it just one of those things that just seemed to happen? Maybe it simply happened. Maybe it happened because I like music. Mm -hmm. I I don't have a very detailed knowledge of jazz or anything else, I suppose. But the challenge, you see, I always liked economy. Mm -hmm. When I was a child, I read all the books in the library on sports. Mm -hmm. And I discovered in reading them that an athlete must be absolutely economical. He mm -hmm. must not waste any part of his body mm -hmm. in performing. And so the idea of the economy stuck with me throughout my whole life. Now, the haiku is a, an extremely demanding form. Mm -hmm. You have only 17 syllables to work with, so you cannot waste a single word. And it, it's deceptively uh, challenging. Yes, yes it is. Mm -hmm. And I, I often said to, uh, to audiences, I said, I think I'm the only one who is writing jazz haiku. <laughs> now, maybe, and that was 10 years ago mm -hmm. that I started, and I'm still doing it, but up to this time, I've seen no other jazz haiku by anybody. Now, maybe it's because they don't know I'm writing them. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why, but I have never, I don't know of anybody else in the world mm -hmm. who is writing jazz and blues haiku. Mm -hmm. I must say, it's a very, very difficult activity. Mm -hmm. I've got out of my bed at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning thinking about a jazz haiku, thinking about an improved word or line. I've got a number of times written it down, turned out the light, and got back in bed and gone to sleep again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the most demanding poetic exercise I've ever tried. Well, James, let me just ask you a, a question then, uh, just to get back to the idea of formal poetry um, regarding meter. Uh, I had done an essay on uh, the American poet Robinson Jeffers, where I sort of tried to debunk what I call the metric fallacy. I think for the last 2,000 years or however, you know, uh, poets have had this idea about, you know, uh, sort of clapping out syllable counts of uh, stressed and uns unstressed syllables and, and having different uh, types of, of feet in poetry. And I've always found that the best poets, whether they intended to or not, really don't adhere to it. And you, unless you, unless you have, you know, someone with a James Earl Jones type voice reading, you know, a Shakespearean verse, meter really doesn't work that well. And uh, I think, you know, uh, certainly with like an E. E. Cummings the idea of, uh, uh, or rather, not even E. E. Cummings, um, William Carlos Williams, more so, uh, plain spoken poetry. Uh, every, that almost everyday language in some ways. Yeah, that that came more into vogue in the early and mid twentieth century. I'm just wondering, uh, do you? Uh, what are your ideas about the idea of meter? Uh, and do you favor a more more uh, casual looseness to musicality in poetry? Meter to me is fine. Meter is fine if it allows your particular idea in a particular poem to express itself in beauty and force and definiteness. Mm -hmm. See, these, these can be the same thing. Mm -hmm. That is, you can say anything you've got to say. You can say it in meter. Mm -hmm. But there are some things that you have to say that cannot be faithfully transmitted in meter. Right. Some things are ragged mm. and mm -hmm. it, and they got they, they're ragged and they have they're like boulders. They have scars on them. Some feelings are just a succession of wounds or scars. Uh -huh. And the idea of meter doesn't go with that. Yeah. The idea of life goes with that. 
that, but the idea of meter, there's something, there's something uh, ineffective about meter when you're treating deep, deep ideas. Mm-hmm. Now, if they happen to go together, fine, but it's only your own sensitivity as a writer that can tell you whether meter is right for the particular poem you're working on. Do you feel sometimes that the deepest feelings expressed in poetry are sometimes done with the simplest language then? I think definitely that's the case. Okay. Definitely. I think my first liking for literature came from the fact that my mother would take us seven children and have us sit around her, and she would read from the Bible. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think it's from the Bible that I picked up an appreciation of the power, the absolute power of simple language. Mm -hmm. And I always had a respect and an admiration for simple language conveyed with beauty. Mm -hmm. Beauty, (laughs) nobody ever talks about beauty. I never read a discussion of beauty on any book on how to write poetry. Well, beauty is sort of passe and a sort of postmodern way, you know, beauty is sort of irrelevant, you know, to, to most, you know, theoretical critics, uh, you know, today. Yeah, but, say? but I, think I, don't, that, I don't, I don't think beauty, if it's real beauty, mm-hmm. is ever irrelevant. Oh, I, I think agree. It's the only thing that touches everybody mm-hmm. is beauty. Mm-hmm. Some people are not touched, are not touched much by death or tragedy, or they say they're not, but beauty, according to the individual's own definition of it, cannot be surpassed. And it is always accompanied by a kind of uh, rhythm. Mm-hmm. People take in beauty rhythmically, and a good poet knows this. Well, James, let me just uh, put you uh, on the spot here a little bit. Um, I One of the reasons I did the essay about you, and I've done other essays on a, a few uh, poets that I think uh, need more uh, exposure, uh, is because I, I think people, you know, rarely actually back up uh, and, and, and talk about what makes something good good. Conversely, I think very few people, and I think most of the poetry that's published or has ever been published is trash, and very few people want to talk about uh, this person or that person uh, being not a good writer or a good poet. And, you know, obviously it's because... Uh, uh, in the publishing industry, at least here in the States, uh, you know, people have their, their forks into so many different pies that, you know, they don't want to, you know, pull something out and get sort of blacklisted, uh, no pun intended. But, uh, if you could just maybe off the top of your head, uh, uh, talk about, you know, maybe a handful or, or just even list, enumerate, uh, some of the poets you think are, are the really great poets, uh, and it could be living poets, could be, you know, uh, past masters. And I've got to ask you for at least one, bad poet that you would consign to the, you know, outer circles of hell. <laughs> <laughs> or two, if you have And, and it has to be a poet that, that we have a little inkling of a name, you know, an idea who it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, Emily Dickinson was a real poet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. George Witcher wrote a book about her, I think, in 1939 with an excellent title. He said the title was This Was a Poet. Mm-hmm. If people could say that about me, I would think my life was successful. Mm-hmm. Emily Dickinson was a real poet. Mm-hmm. Gwendolyn Brooks was a real poet. Mm-hmm. I mean, these people breathed and spoke poetry without even trying. I don't know about Emily Dickinson talking, but I know about Gwendolyn Brooks, who I, who, whom I knew briefly as a very nice person. Mm-hmm. She was just, she was a poet. Now, Robert Hayden is a good poet. Mm-hmm. Robert Frost, I get, I get mixed up with these Roberts. <laughs> Robert <laughs> Frost was a good poet. Robert Lowell was a good poet. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know the whole work of any poet, uh-huh. but I've, I've liked certain works by certain, certain poets. County Cullen has written some brilliant sonnets. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think I think Cullen, E.E. E. Cummings, and uh, Malay uh, would be my uh, the three best pure lyricists in terms of forgetting what they said, but in terms of just the sound in their in their mu- in terms of musicality, I, those I think were the three big American pure lyricists just for the ear. Mm-hmm. Well, Whitman has written some beautiful poetry mm, too. Yeah. And when I say beautiful, I don't mean cute. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I mean beautiful. There's a difference. Yeah. 
Uh, um, I guess I'm sure there are other poets. Eberhard, Eberhard has written some good stuff. Mm -hmm. Dylan Thomas. Mm -hmm. mm, I've admired particular poems, but as I say, I don't know enough about the whole work of any poet to make a judgment of the poet himself. Okay. Well, suppose suppose I was really angry at you and I had to consign you into a room with just one book of poetry to torture you. Which poet would that uh, be? Mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a good answer, but but you, but yeah, <laughs> but but uh, is there not really one poet? And I'll I'll give you an out by saying you can be a dead poet. Is there one poet that you just really just have shaken your head and said, "How the hell did this get published?" Uh, you know, if I see poems like that, I probably would I'd forget the name of the poet. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I really can't think of anybody. For one thing, oh, I, I don't deal in negative things. For uh -huh. example, many, many negative facts in my life, I have simply forgotten. Okay. So if it's really a bad poem, I probably wouldn't remember the name of the poet. I've seen, I've seen uh, poems that I, you know, that I think are almost nothing. Yeah. And I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the names of the poets concerned. Right. Well, it's sort of like when I first stumbled across your book. Uh, you know, I'll I can sort of skim by my by my eye, and I'll I'll go through twenty pages in a few minutes, just you know, looking at the poems, and you know, I I almost have a robotic in, in able to scan the information. But a good poet, like when I came across your book, or uh, someone like Judith Wright from Australia. I don't know if you're familiar with her work. Yeah, I've, I've read some of her stuff. Yes, uh, they stop me and make me want to go back and reread and that's that's yeah. that's the those are those little nuggets those phrases those words the the construction that you know when you uh stop you're reading something worth reading and yeah i had a letter from an old colleague at the univers uh, city university of new york for christmas his name is dave buckley you know dave buckley he's a novelist short a fiction writer and he said that he had been reading the poetry in my book force and the reckoning mm -hmm. and he mm -hmm. said just what you said now that he was forced to go back and read again. So yeah. maybe that does mean something when you realize you must go back and well, and those dig the, into this again. That's a good sign. And those are the ones we remember. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. And I know you know a lot of times when when uh, you go to cafes or some of the people give you a, a compliment and they sort of kiss your ass a little bit. But I'll tell you the best compliment I ever got was a fellow who did a, a story on me a few years ago for a local magazine, and he said that that reading my poems made him a better reader. And I think what what more could any person want than that, uh, you know that kind of a, a compliment, you know, or a painter that you know you made I, you made me see things differently. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good compliment he gave you. Yeah. Yes. Well, let me just ask you. This is something that I know Jessica had wanted to ask uh, ask me to ask you. Um, she she gets a little frustrated when she she reads uh, uh, essays or hears uh, uh, people uh, uh, in interviews speaking about uh, subjectivity versus objectivity, and she thinks that one of the the sort of outs that uh, bad writers or bad artists of any sort get is saying, "Well, everything's subjective anyway." You know how who can who can say this is bad or whatnot? And I think obviously that's unfair to 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 any uh, good or great artist to to say if everything's subjective. I mean, there has to be some kind of ob objective worth that you can bring to it. People can disag disagree normally, but for example, you know, I don't think anyone in their right mind would com try to compare someone like a Eugene Field to a Walt Whitman. <laughs> I don't think so. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, another another sort of bete noir of uh, poetry uh, in the last uh, few decades, at least here in America. And I don't know. Uh, maybe Jean might know this a bit more. Uh, Jean, is, is political correctness a force in Europe? Um, the idea that you can't, you know, say anything to hurt someone's feelings. Uh, Fortunately, not. Oh, oh, good. Some people have it ingrained in themselves, you know and will not say anything that is non you to uh, repeat what uh, Nancy Mitford invented a few years ago. But uh, mostly were free, thank God, or dog. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, another, because the reason I ask is, uh, you know, uh, here in America in the last 20 or so years, uh, we've gotten even 
worse, I think, than sort of the confessionalist poets. And, you know, there there were some great confessionalists. You know, James mentioned uh, a Robert Lowell and, you know, a Sylvia Plath and an Anne Sexton are the big names that stick out. But in the last couple of decades, the whole idea that poetry must be truth or art is truth. And I've always found that the best artists that I've met in any field are, are damn good liars. And uh, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Art is a lie. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. Art is a lie because it's man-made. Mm -hmm. And Jane I'm not believing in God at all, but man cannot just create anything perfect. Man can try to reach perfection, but man must lie. And when man, when a man thinks, or a man or woman, when a person thinks they are artists, then form takes over, and the lie might become very, very bad if form is not assimilated. Yeah. And form has, there has to be form. Even the jazz haiku means that there is form somewhere. Right. But the form is just like perfume with a woman. It must not be smelt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it must be that subtle. Yes. 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 Yeah. And, I, I, and James, I assume you assent to that? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but when you think of the truth in lies, to me, let's say, I'm talking about poetry. The truth or the lie that is connected with it as a, as a subject doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If, a, a, let's say, a first-class poem can transmit a lie, mm -hmm. let's say, especially if that lie is the full substance of a human being's experience. Mm, mm -hmm. That's the thing. Yeah. We what we want to know. <laughs> we want to know. We want to know people. We want to see people and feel them in art. Mm -hmm. At least for me, because my 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 subject, I think, always is human beings, right. human beings, and the human being might be temporarily a human being might be temporarily a lie yeah if so if this is his reality i want to see it and feel it well james we're gonna end this segment shortly here and listen to a few of the jazz haiku that you just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago but before we do uh, i want to touch on one final point in this segment um in our first show that art and i did i uh, talked about what I've come to call the divine inspiration fallacy uh, in why artists tend to have this sort of uh, uh, cutthroat jealousy of other artists. And my ba the basic posit is this, that uh, I've always felt that whatever I write, good, bad, or indifferent, comes from whatever is Dan Schneider. And same thing with Art Durkee or whatever other artist, my wife or, or any other artist, it comes from them. But I've got this idea, I, and I think it explains most of the artistic jealousy. And, you know, you can look back through the centuries, art rival artists. Uh, they have this idea, I think, that uh, they're merely tuning forks or antenna for uh, something out there in the cosmos. And that if they, someone somehow divines into uh, uh, that moment of greatness that somehow there's less for them i'm just wondering if you've had any ideas about uh, why there seems to be such rivalry sometimes between artists you know i mentioned uh, cullen and hughes uh before and if the idea that idea that there's something out there that is taken away that they could possibly have done might be a reason for these kinds of petty jealousies well i guess petty jealousies are a part of human nature if the human nature involved is not mature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think for uh, what I'm ultimately getting at is that envy is one feeling which to me is never justified. Okay. Never justified. Because envy always suggests a lack of understanding of the person who is being envied. Mm -hmm. That is, an action which produces envy is an action that always has a price tag on it. Mm. And you never know how much a person has paid for a product which you might envy. Mm -hmm. I think it's a big mistake yeah. to I... envy anybody. I could never do it because you don't know, you don't know the whole story. Right. Maybe the thing that you envy is a thing that you yourself would never want to produce. 
if you knew the cost yeah. that yeah. was attached to it. I'd say envy is never justified. And I know uh, I run a poetry group here in Minneapolis called Uptown Poetry Group, and I know one of the, the more exciting things that I look forward to twice a month is uh, hopefully someone else uh, other than myself will bring a poem that will make my eyes wide and you know I start to get salivating, something really good, yeah, because yeah. it makes me want to say, hmm, how did they do that? How can I do something like that? You know, Break it down and, and try to, to figure them out. It, it's something that energizes me. And, and yet, oddly, I've found... When, when I've been at like readings and someone has done something good, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll want to go up and, and talk to that person. But a lot of other people, you know, they'll s- sort of shy away and, uh, you know, it, it is that envy thing. But, hmm. well, I think people who feel that way have not really grown up yet. There's some, there's some hole in the fabric of their being that they haven't been able to mend. Mm hmm. Or maybe they haven't even tried to mend it, or they don't know it's there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Some people go around in raggedy clothes that they don't know it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, now, James, we're going to listen to a few of the jazz haiku that you and Art Durkee had mentioned as we had end this segment, and then we'll come back and speak a bit more. Jazz anatomy, everything is jazz. Snails, jail, rails, tail, males, females, snow white, cotton bale. Knee bone, thigh, hip bone, jazz slips you. Percussion bone classified unknown. Sleek lizard rhythms, cigar smoke tunes, straight gin sky lace with double moons. Second chance rhythms, don't give up riffs. Jazz gets high off can'ts, buts, and ifs. Jazz roads, North Star raise no sound, no jazz on the underground, whole railway broke down. Storyville gossip, washboard lie, gather up jazz when all the clothes dry. Drank its own rhythms, sucked its rhyme, cannibalized its ripe flesh sometimes. Jazz mobile coughed, stopped, refueled with ragtime, blues, swing, revved up and bebop. Jazz actions, basketball music, go get 'em sound. Jazz baby. From every rebound, soars, leapfrogs, yells, jazz, but don't expect no tantrums, no crazy man spells. Snatched from the attic, hacked from the floor, household notes, domestic no more. Sweet talking music, hands on style. Be back, baby, to collect that smile.
white stiff shirt glances, white gloves rest, jazz takes chances at its black tie best. Great jazz men, Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, Satchmo's warm burlap, Duke's cool cashmere, fine fabrics make your love come here. Miles Davis, Miles, Woods Cat. Believed by birds he's stalking, bereaved, bent over, talking. Charlie Bird Parker, once ugly duckling, rich plumage grew, poised, bird flew, flocks followed, me too. John Coltrane, love supreme jazz train, tops, prompt lightning express, but made all local stops. Jelly Roll Morton, 88 diamonds, stick pen smile. Real skin tight jazz. That's Jelly Roll style. Sonny Rollins under the Williamsburg Bridge. World waif. Long wolf notes. Blown in pain with all his might. Heal themselves. In flight. Earl Father Hines, slick skullcap hair, tilt in his smile, thumping each key he trumpets a while. Count Basie, last chance dance. Her cheek warms his chest. One o'clock jump swings jitterbug. <laughs> Coleman Hawkins, young boy, doomed, horn beats defiant, fast, pride battling while forty years pass. Johnny Hodge bent over a sad note, turned back by the wall, straightened up, stretched, found itself tall. He had it bad, Lord, blew it cool. That saxophone was nobody's fool. Lester Young, how'd you do it, Prez? Stay nice, cool, when all that jazz chose another school. His Volkswagen jazz, classic. Never rocked and rolled, road tolls paid in gold. Chet Baker, songbird, lost, bright lights his guide afar, jazz his fate, Icarus his star. Harold Garner, splash elegant notes, slant wise leap one another, 
Tic tac toes, brother. Thelonious monk. Black cap. Inside out, walk straight, no chase and no doubt. Monk circling far out. Black cap upside down, him straight, no chaser around. Monk, just one monk found. Ella and Joe, pinball lady scats, tisket wraps, tasket bumps back, wins yellow basket. <laughs> Singing summertime, nectar crinkling on her face, ecstasy and grace. She raised champagne lips, danced inside banana hips, all Paris wooed Joe. Banana panties, perfumed belt, jazz, tattooing lush ecstasies felt. Josephine, royal, jeweling her dance, flushing the bosom of France. Billy and Mahalia, sweets sometimes, whorehound, candy floss, come bad coin days, she sang one more toss, hurt, always hurt, wounds, bled wounds, scarred stand-up this worn, sad. Okay, uh, we're here. Omniverska's uh, second show is about to wrap up. We've been speaking with uh, three individuals, most prominently James Emmanuel, an American poet living in France, his translator Jean Magren, uh, and also uh, Godlieb Simons, his uh, documentarian. Uh, James, uh, before we uh, wrap up this show, I've just got a couple of sort of questions that I'm going to throw at you right at that and see if uh, sort of word association. Let me just ask you this. If you had your greatest poem and there was the, the proverbial uh, uh, fire in a building and you had a choice, but let's say, between saving your collected poems or, you know, some life of some stranger you've never met, which would you put more value on? Oh, the life of a stranger. You would? Yeah. Uh, what selfish accomplishment of yours would you uh, not trade for anything else? If, you know, your, what, what accomplishment in your life no matter what amount of money would you not trade? I'm not sure. Hmm. I'm not sure. One thing that Godlieb and I have done, uh -huh. we have done a series of uh, artworks, her engraving, plus my haiku, hmm. for 17 different uh, works of art for Mumia Abu Jamal. Uh -huh. Okay. You know the name? Yes. yes. We've done 17 works of art for him to give to him when <laughs> when he gets out of prison right if he mm -hmm. does now i'm i'm proud of that mm -hmm. i'm proud of that well art do you have a final uh, statement a uh, uh, question no i'm i am just overwhelmed thank you uh this has been a real pleasure it's it's also been real uh wonderful to hear both james and jean tell the truth and and spitfire where needed about poetry in the world as well as uh in europe and in the u.s well, uh, and James, I just want to say, uh, just uh, as a final statement to end the show, you know, uh, in our correspondence, one of the things that I found a little sad is that you, there seems to be almost a resignation uh, in, 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 in your letters that, that you're going to be, like, neglected. And I just want to, want to state, 
there's a good track record of, of artists that didn't get their due in the, the prime of their life or even in their whole lifetimes coming through. And one of the reasons that uh, uh, one of the good things that I think comes about when someone has some kind of success otherwise is that they can sort of shine the spotlight on other people. And so one of the reasons that we're doing this show is to try to heighten our profile to get published in art and other uh, art fields as well. And, uh, you know, what generally happens is that attendant people, people who, who then look at the work of, say, an art or myself, and then we'll look at the people that have been influences. So, and the people that we list that we like, yeah. you know, and, and would like to tell people about. I mean, I tell people about Judith Wright's work, too, at times, you know. And, and I, think, I think, you know, there's, there's the, the old idea that something that's good, you just hold it up to the light and, and, and people eventually see it. So I, I would just encourage you to not sort of despair if there's any, been any moments of despair, because I think, uh, I think uh, your work will uh, survive uh, yeah. your death yeah. and beyond. I think it will last. I really do. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> and and thank you for being on the show, uh, yeah. James, uh, Jean, and uh, Godleev. Thanks. And this is the end of the Omniverse Second Show. And Art. Thanks very much. Uh, this is Arthur Durkee and Dan Schneider and Dave Wesley signing off. Tune in next month for the next episode. <laughs> Wow, wow, wow.